if there are predicate devices, uh, the term FDA likes to use, so if approved devices out there that your device is similar to, you can go through the 510K pathway and we'll, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Again, same as with drugs and biologics, uh, FDA does have a, a pre-IDE meeting process. They call it a pre-submission process. Uh, again, we've, we've helped our faculty numerous times go to the FDA in a pre-submission uh, meeting process and it can be, again, extremely helpful. Again, specifically because you may not need a lot of preclinical information or uh, human clinical information to start uh, your human clinical trials. So, um, I'll start off with some definitions. I know it's really exciting stuff, but it's, it's really important to understand from an FDA standpoint what they consider uh, the definitions for drugs, medical devices, and so forth. So starting out with a drug, from an FDA perspective, their definition of a drug are articles used to treat, mitigate, cure, diagnose, prevent a disease in man or other animals, and articles intended to affect the structure of, or any function of the body. Again, this is a really important definition because how uh, FDA applies IND regulations is based on this definition. Investigational new drug, or investigational drug is simply uh, a drug that's subject to a clinical investigation, so pretty straightforward. And then an IND application is, is a, a submission to the FDA to allow um, human clinical trials with an investigational drug. So definitions related to devices, um, you know, I'll just, talk a little bit about the, the highlighted in red section, which is very similar to the drug and biologic definition. Intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of the disease uh, in, in man or other animals. So there you have it again. Cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of the disease process. So very similar between devices and uh, drugs and biologics. Investigational device, again, subject of the clinical study. And ID application, similar to an IND application, is uh, a submission to the FDA to allow uh, the human clinical problems. Further definitions, a sponsor from an FDA standpoint is the person who holds an IND or an IDE. Um, it's not the funding organization. Here in academics, we often refer to our, uh, the person giving us the money for the, for the research as our sponsor, not from an FDA perspective. So that's an important key distinction. Investigator is an individual under whose immediate direction the drug device is administered or dispensed. And a sponsor investigator, you hold the, the definition of both of those. So in academics, uh, typically what happens is the, the person that holds the IND or an IDE for, for a uh, clinical investigation is a sponsor investigator. So the, the, both sides of that definition apply. And further, all of the sets of responsibilities for both the sponsor and an investigator when you hold an IND or IDE apply. So further, key regulations. Um, so you know, you, you all have to jump through this hoop that we call the regulations. And you know, from your great idea, jumping through those key regulations, the hoops, um, to get to your successful trial and publication. So, I'll go through some of these. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I just wanted to highlight uh, the, the regulations that are out there. And depending on what what kind of uh, clinical research you're involved with, some of these or all of these may apply. So it all started with the FD and C Act, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which originally gave the FDA authority to uh, regulate drugs and devices. Um, these are all in the Code of Federal Regulations, or the CFRs. So here's a list of all of these regulations. Um, 21 CFR Part 312 is applicable to IND drugs and biologics. So essentially the uh, IND submit application submission recipe is within these regulations. It tells you everything you need to have in there. And then uh, Part 812 is the IDD for medical devices. And then again, there are the, the marketing application regulations that are listed here. And I think you guys will have access to Slides. So again, I, you guys can do this. And if you have trouble sleeping, I encourage you to you know, take out the photo <laughs> You won't have any trouble sleeping. And then further, uh, there's a, another set of a whole uh, series of sets of regulations that apply to all kinds of components of 
uh, your, your potentially your clinical research, electronic signatures, uh, protection of human subjects. Um, what I would like to note is FDA has a 21 CFR Part 50, which is their protection of human subjects. If it's federally funded, if you, if you have federal funding uh, tied to your to your research, you also have the DHHS protection of human subjects. So if you have federal funding and you have uh, an IND or an IDE for your study, you have two sets of uh, human subject protections you need to be aware of. Um, there are some nuances between the two, so again, just uh, be, be aware of that. So now I'll go into the IND process. Again, this is not a course to teach you how to do this, but just really to sort of open your eyes and, and think about when, when you design your next research study, are there FDA implications that need to be considered? When do you need an IND? Well, if the drug is not approved by the FDA, you have to have an IND to do a clinical study, a clinical study a human clinical study. If you uh, intend to conduct a study with an approved drug, but it's a new indication or population, if it's a new dosage form, or a dosage range that's not covered in the current package insert. So all of these would constitute off-label, so an approved drug in an off-label fashion. You may need to consider an IND for, um, for your research. And again, I go back to the FDA definition. Always go back to the FDA definition of cure, mitigating, treating, diagnosing a disease process. If, if that definition holds true for what you're, what you're involved with, then you may have IND implications FDA does have exemption criteria uh, to be exempt from an IND from the IND reg regulations. Um, if it's a lawfully marketed uh, drug in the U.S., so you're using this off-label, but it's not intended to support a new indication, not intended to support a change in advertising, um, conducted in compliance with IRB and informed consent, or it complies with the requirements for promotion and, and charging of investigational drugs. And you'll see I intentionally left out the, the one that is sort of the nebulous catch-all in my, from my perspective from the FDA, which is not intended to, or does not involve a factor that increases risk of use. What does that mean? You know, so, um, so I think FDA intentionally left that nebulous to uh, allow for a lot of interpretation. Um, but FDA, I mentioned, uh, you know, almost 60 pages of guidance documents, the list of guidance documents. A couple to point out that are really helpful uh, to take a peek at. Now, back in January 2004, FDA put out this guidance document, <coughs> which is for oncology products. So I, I realize that doesn't apply to you guys. But with that said, I mean, there is some really interesting information in here uh, on the FDA's current thinking at the time back in 2004. Because I think what they were, what was happening at the time they were getting lots of inquiries. Does my study need an IND? And so it goes through a decision process of, of thinking through the exemption criteria of whether you need an IND or not. In October 2010, they updated, or they, they put out another guidance document, which is more applicable to, I think, all of you. Um, Investigational new drug applications determining whether human research studies can be conducted without an IND. Again, it walks you through this process. There's a lot of question and answers uh, embodied in this guidance document. But the one thing I will mention, one of the examples they give is, if I want to use uh, bean sprouts, so the food product bean sprouts, in my study uh, to try to cure some form of cancer, do I need an IND? And they emphatically say, yes, you do, because you're using bean sprouts, again, as a drug, it meets the definition of a drug, so therefore FDA in that example is saying, you need an IND for using the use of bean sprouts in your oncology study. So I just put that out there because we actually have a number of INDs here at the University of Michigan, one for cranberry powder, grape seed extract, you know, all of these things that you, you know, if you think through it, you'd be like, no way, why would I need an IND for something like that? Well, because again, it met the definition of drug and, it's, and those products are being used to treat some form of something. So just a quick note about uh, what's required. If you need to go to the FDA for an IN, with an IND, um, this is listed in the regulations. Um, again, 312.23. 3, um, and that's sort of the, uh, the table of contents that they have in there. Um, so if you do need to move forward with that, um, here's the list. 
Uh, what I do want to note is a grant application is not a protocol. Um, we very frequently, um, when we're asked to assist one of our faculty, they send us their grant application and say, here's my protocol. That's not the case because a protocol, uh, you know, from a good clinical practice standpoint, a protocol is the required element of good clinical practice. Your material from your grant application do not typically provide sufficient information or data. So again, think about when, when you're writing your grant application, it, it doesn't have a lot of the protocol elements that FDA requires. Um, protocol serves as the primary source document for the trial, has your methodology, all the documents, the study drug, dosage, all of that information, which your grant proposal may not have. So again, just keep that in mind. Um, if you need to submit an IND application at some point, FDA will be expecting a protocol. And again, they don't consider a grant application to be a protocol. Um, the FDA uh, website has gotten a lot better over the last couple of years. Um, what I'm showing here, and I give you the link to, is a really nice uh, uh, section of their website that talks all about investigational new drug applications, and in particular, the sections that are required some information on uh, what FDA is going to be expecting and whatnot. So again, if you get to a point where you need to uh, submit an IND application, this is a, this particular web page is a really, really good resource. If you submit an IND um, and it's been, um, you have a safe to proceed letter from the FDA, just note that you have a set of responsibilities uh, that you're going to be required to, to keep. Um, Again, I just wanted to put this up there uh, just so you have awareness uh, if you submit an IND, what's going to be expected of you. So there's a lot of reporting requirements, including annual reports, uh, safety reports, protocol amendments, and things like that. Similar to the uh, information that you have to submit to your IRB, it also has to go to the FDA. So I think, I, I did look through your project list. I don't think very many or, or any of you are doing medical uh, device research, but I did want to walk through this a little bit just because it is a different process than, than the IND or the drug biologic process. Medical devices are, are based on this schema. So FDA has a risk-based classification. So if the patient risk increases, your regulatory controls increase. So represented by the bars and the class of, of the device. So class one, you have just general controls. You can see the, the bars low, so you know, patient risk is low, your regulatory control and your regulatory burden is going to be low. Class two uh, requires general and special controls. Um, these are typically devices that go through a 510k process. Um, sometimes there uh, is a requirement for an IDE, so just keep that in mind if you have a class two device. Class three devices are the highest risk. Um, these are typically implants, um, devices that are used to sustain life, uh, things of that nature. Uh, these are required to go through the pre-market approval process, which is the highest burden as far as the marketing process is concerned. And an IDE will always be required for class three devices. So you can see the regulatory burden, the regulatory controls are much higher for class three devices. Uh, a good guidance document uh, from FDA, uh, specifically about significant risk and non-significant risk medical devices. This is the first bar that you have to pass with medical device research. In, specifically if you're doing uh, medical research, human medical research. So you need to present to your IRB uh, a significant or not significant uh, risk analysis and the burden is on you or the company to actually provide that information so that the IRB can then make a decision on significant versus not significant risk. This is a really important aspect of this uh, because again, um, so actually let me walk into who decides uh, whether it's significant or not significant. I mentioned that the sponsor, the, the investigator initially puts the information to the IRB. IRBs are required actually to make this uh, determination. And FDA, of course, is available to help. They're the final auditor. We occasionally do go to uh, the FDA with a risk determination. That will. Um, so again, it, we can go directly to the FDA, um, but typically the process starts with the IRB, present information to the IRB. Uh, 
Um, again, significant risk device is an investigational device that is intended as an implant, presents potential for serious uh, to the health, safety, or welfare of the subject, support human life, uh, substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, and mitigating the disease process. Again, there's that definition. Otherwise, presents potential for serious risk to the subject. And then non-significant risk devices, um, Obviously, the opposite here uh, don't pose a potential for serious risk to uh, the human subjects. Um, non significant risk device studies only require IRB concurrence that is non significant risk. So, FDA allows local IRBs to be their surrogate, if you will, the FDA surrogate. So, if the, IRB, the local IRB agrees with your non significant risk determination, you do not have to go to the FDA, and the IRB will oversee that study. Have no, no further reporting requirements to the FDA. Um, there are exemption criteria very similar to uh, drugs and biologics where uh, you go through sort of a, a decision uh, process. We have developed worksheets internal to the U of M to help our investigators with this process. Um, but as I, I think the executive is using accordance with indications and labeling, so you know, the, pack, the package insert or the instructions for use if you're following that. And obviously, it's I, I need to be exempt. Um, Non-invasive diagnostics, consumer preference testing, if you're using it solely for veterinary use and research on early lab. One thing to note, uh, with NSR, non-significant risk studies, you do have uh, abbreviated uh, requirements. And this is per 21 CFR 812.2b. Um, you have to label it. So the device has to be labeled appropriately. That's an investigational device. Obviously, have to have IRB approval, informed consent, uh, monitoring. That's that's something that often gets overlooked in these non-significant risk studies. And what I mean by monitoring is that there has to be um, oversight as far as the day-to-day -day operations are concerned. You know, someone looking at making sure informed consent was obtained properly, looking at safety uh, aspects of, of the study. Um, record keeping is really important. You still have to uh, do reports, obviously, to IRB and others as required, and prohibition, uh, prohibition against promotion. So you can't put out a label that this is safe and effective because that's uh, we're doing the research to find that out. So again, here's a list of the requirements for an ID application for significant risk devices. Uh, again, I won't go through that. Uh, like the drug and biologic website of the FDA, the ID process, there's a really nice aspect of the FDA's website that lays this all out. Um, that is listed here. And then if you do hold an ID, again, just like an IND, you have responsibilities. Um, so there are reporting responsibilities very similar. The semantics are a little bit different as far as what they call these various reports. Um, and again, I list the timing of when these reports are required. I want to go into this a little bit, um, challenges and solutions for early sponsor investigator support. So this is sort of something we've developed locally. Um, I recognize that not all of you have a robust regulatory support at your various institutions, but we kind of break it up into these four different categories when we think through this. So gap analysis, the regulatory writing aspects, industry interaction and FDA interaction. So from a gap uh, analysis perspective, um, sponsor investigators often provide clinical protocols and study related materials with information gaps. So going back to the grant narrative, um, there's typically information gaps in that. So you know, oftentimes we start out with, again, what the investigators are considering, considering a protocol, which is their grant narrative. We have to do a lot of work from a protocol perspective, either developing a protocol, refining a protocol, so on and so forth. So some of the solutions for gap analysis, reviewing the medical literature, FDA guidance documents again. I know it would be painful to go through 60 pages uh, for the list of guidance documents, but Google is, is actually really good about helping you find appropriate guidance documents. Um, research similar products in a regulatory path. So again, you think about other products that are on the market, whether it be a medical device or a drug or biologic, what, what do they have to go through from a regulatory aspect to, to move forward? And further, their, their marketing pathway, what do their marketing pathway look like? 
And then for due diligence on the non-clinical and clinical study data to support the INPRDE. Again, FDAs may require certain preclinical studies depending on what you're what you're developing. Um, it's it's going to look very different between drugs, biologics, and medical devices. From a regulatory writing perspective, uh, the challenge is FDA submissions require a unique format for the writing with it. attention to the principles of good clinical practice. So. FDA has their own speed, just like lawyers have their own speed. FDA kind of has their expectations of how, uh, you know, the format, what something, how something is written, um, things like that. So it's important to understand what the FDA is going to be expecting. And again, going back to the, for the INDs and, and the IDE application submissions, go to those websites and it'll give you um, examples of what they're expecting and give you some information so do some diligence for that if, if you uh, go down this pathway. Um, transform clinical protocols into INDID submissions. Again, taking that grant narrative, putting it in protocol format, and putting it in your IND or ID application. Um, it's, it's helpful to get assistance with your informed consent documents. So if you have um, somebody within your IRB or a study coordinator or something that can help with your informed consent, and then assistance with IRB submissions. So again, study coordinators um, can play a, a really good role here in both uh, informed consent documents, IRB submissions, and then industry interaction. Um, because I think a lot of a lot of what we see uh, at the University of Michigan and around our peer academic institutions is this off-label use of, of drugs and biologics and medical devices, for that matter. So we need to make sure that we're interacting with our industry partners uh, that make that, that drug or biologic or that medical device. Oftentimes, our sponsor investigators have limited experience in their interactions with their industrial partners. So, um, you know, things that we uh, support and assist with, uh, obtaining letters of authorization, right of reference, and investigator brochures. So, one, you know, two components a number of components in both IND and IDE applications has to do with, uh, for medical devices, device design, manufacturing, all those types of, uh, all that type of information. For INDs, chemistry manufacturing controls information. So in academics, I mean, we're, we're not a development shop. So we don't have all of the information, all the preclinical toxicology, pharmacology information for drugs and biologics, all of the device design, manufacturing information for medical devices. So the industry partner that we're, that we're interested in working with that has the product that uh, we want to study, do research with, we need to develop that relationship so that we can then uh, reference their information that they already have on file with the FDA. And then FDA interaction. Uh, sponsor investigators have limited experience interacting with FDA, limited knowledge of FDA requirements, and limited resources to, to address these gaps. So again, arm yourself with the knowledge that's available out there. Do some diligence ahead of uh, interactions with the FDA. Um, conduct IND ID submissions and maintenance. Prepare and submit FDA meeting packets. Again, utilize pre-IND, pre-submission uh, pathways with the FDA. It can be very, very helpful. Uh, attendance at FDA meetings, response uh, to FDA inquiries and requests, and assistance with studies like monitoring and audit preparation. So I'll just leave you with this. Um, this is Tyler Brack. He, why he decided to do this, but he launched himself in a kayak over a 189 foot waterfall in Washington State. Um, so again, I, I'm just showing some of these pictures, not only to spice up a very dull um, topic, but also to show, um, you know, that the regulatory pathway um, can be daunting, um, but you know, like this guy, he decided to launch himself over a little record waterfall. We can do this. <laughs> so with that, I'll stop and ask for any questions or comments.
but you're, and it's an implantable device, but you're placing, the, you're moving the, the location of the device. Is that something that requires device extension? Okay, it's quite likely you put like A or a will. Especially being an implantable device, you really need to make sure you understand that. All right, thanks for the very nice call. And <laughs> so, um, my scenario is we're using a, looking to use a drug that's made it up through like our into phase three trials for uh, for a kidney disorder. That we're looking to use it for a neurological disorder. So when we submit our IND, uh, because it's for a new indication and for a new population, HIV population, how's that going to differ from like submitting an IND for a brand new uh, drug before like, before like a phase one trial? So. Um the, the IND itself doesn't necessarily differ that much. What, what's going to be different in the body of the application is, again, describing exactly what you're going to be doing. So the protocol is going to be different, obviously, because in the new indication, new population. Um, so your protocol, that's going to be the biggest difference between the original IND that the company filed and what your IND is going to look like. And as far as providing like preclinical data, do we need to get that from the pharmaceutical company or can we just cite the papers that they publish and provide that data? Yeah, my, my recommendation is to, to first always uh, reach out to your industrial partner that you're working with uh, because what they can provide is, is this letter of authorization to cross-reference um, their, their open and active IND or INDs that they may have for the, for the drug. Um, and what that allows, it, it doesn't allow you necessarily access to that information. What it does is it allows FDA to go into the company's files and look at that information for your IND application submission. So th those, in my opinion, are critical because I mean, we, we've had to do a number of IND applications where we had to provide all of the chemistry manufacturing control information. And it's, I mean, they're some of the largest documents I've ever seen before. So. Um, again, highly encouraged to work with the company. Um, we've had companies that said, no, thank you, uh, we don't want to support this. Uh, what we do in that situation is you know, look to the published literature and find papers um, and you know, see if that can support it.
may be of great interest to them because it potentially is another area, um, you know, to, to help with you know, the, the, the challenge of a drug will not have. So, um, so I would say reach out to the original. Uh, we've, we've had probably more companies that said no thank you because it is not on patent, but we have had companies say, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to extend the patent. So, um, but you know, I think to answer the first part of your question, um, if it's if it's something that's generic and uh, you can get it, you know, from, from multiple uh, companies, whatnot. I mean, we, we can use a package insert um, for you know, like chemistry manufacturing control sections, um, things like that. So, you know, there's there's a couple of ways to think through that. Does that help? So do they retain rights? Do I have to get permission or yeah. you know, yeah. the, their, their major incentive, though, is if you study a new population and it, it identifies some, their risk is mostly downstream. If you identify a new adverse effect in a new population, you can tank their drug. So that's, you have to think about it from their perspective. So that, that gives them a sort of baseline opinion of maybe I won't be so helpful. Because if, if depending on the, the population you're studying, if you find a new adverse event in your study, that <coughs> only hurts them. And it's probably not going to help them that much if they're not making that much money off of it. Okay. Uh, again, I would also like to point out the converse of that, which is, you know, if, if it's a huge success in the indication of the population you're looking at, I mean, that could be a big win for the company, too. So, I've seen both sides. Uh, my question is about computerized diagnostic algorithms. Um, so there's some line between a diagnostic device that spits out an answer and has some microchip in it, which is clearly if the FDA is regulating and says you have X diagnosis or whatever. Uh, and then there's all the way to sort of decision support in your electronic health record that says, uh, you know, I suggest you consider this in your diagnosis or whatever. Where is the FDA now on that spectrum? Where do they stop? Where is where is the end of the FDA's burden still? We well, don't know yet. Yeah. Um, but with, with that said, I mean, FDA did come out with a guidance document not too long ago. I think it was in the fall, um, specifically about mobile medical apps and algorithmic types of software. Um, and it it is really helpful actually to go back and take a peek at that um, because what what they recognizing this guidance document is that they're going to um, they're going to have regulatory discretion or enforcement discretion is the terminology they use. So, um, so to those of us in the regulatory field, enforcement discretion means they're going to not look at things as closely as they would that they're you know, that they're uh, having enforcement over. So. But what, what we're still waiting for is, it was supposed to come out, I think, in the spring, but there's another guidance document that's going to come out about decisional support that, that you mentioned. Um, we haven't seen that yet, um, but you know, when I, when I talk to faculty at UVM about this very topic, you know, the one thing that I, I really point to is if, if you're basing the output of your algorithm or mobile app, whatever it may be, if you're making clinical decisions or it's influencing your clinical decision making, then there's considerations that, that you have to think through. Um, so, you know, again, the answer is we're still waiting on FDA, but so far they've, they've been uh, having enforcement discretion on mobile medical apps in particular. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more to come. Uh, FDA is really reeling in this area because I think at last count there were 40,000 medical apps or something like that. And so they're, they're scrambling to keep up. So they're, so jury's still up. Okay, thank you. One more question and then we'll head for lunch and you can ask questions individually. So just a quick question about um, the indications to file an IND you had mentioned. Um, you know, using a drug for new indication slash new population. You know, my situation is that I'm looking at a drug, I had approached, uh, I had filed an IND for a um, drug 
to treat cognition in a certain type of dementia. And now I'm interested in using this drug for the same indication, treating cognition, but in a different type of dementia population. Based on that scenario, do I need to, again, file an IND? No, actually, FDA does allow you to submit multiple protocols under that IND. So I would suggest you know, generating and designing your new protocol, submit it as a protocol amendment to the FDA, and let them take a look at it. And that's how industry does it. I mean, for all, you know, all of their phases of testing, they're submitting you know, that, the subsequent protocols to the same IND. So um, sponsor investigators in academic settings are allowed to do the same thing. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin, and we'll 